Okay, good afternoon. We are going to proceed with the next session, which is entitled Internet Governance and the Development in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Shona Nosepa. I'm the manager of regional affairs for Latin America and the Caribbean for Internet Society. Prior to working with um, Internet Society, I've been the manager of regional um, relations for ICANN, for the Caribbean, for more than three years. And prior to working for ICANN, I was a policy advisor and a regulator in the Netherlands Antilles at that time. And before that, I've worked for the incumbent operator in Curacao, UTS, as well. So this afternoon, we have a panel of some very knowledgeable people, and we will be discussing internet governance. So um, when we talk about internet governance, basically there are two key words here. We see internet, and we see another word, which is um, governance. I think internet, that's quite straightforward for us, given that we have been discussing that. So I assume that most of us are acquainted with what we mean with internet. But the other word, governance, that's, that's more a blurred word. What does governance mean? If you ask a Spanish speaker or someone's um, a French speaker or any language which, which is based on Latin, most of them will think on something else. When they see governance, they will think immediately on government or gobierno in Spanish. So um, the English speaking world does something else. They they define government as something else. So that's why we have seen um, when we started all these discussions with respect to internet governance, we saw only people from the government attending these events because they thought this is something for government officials. But that's not the case nowadays. Governments stand more for um, the way that you deal with a particular issue. So it, it doesn't have any, um, nothing to do with only um, government. So as I said before, we have a group here of um, some very knowledgeable um, persons. I would like to start first with Albert Daniels. He is the manager. Albert Daniels has recently been appointed as ICANN Global Stakeholder Engagement Manager for the Caribbean. Albert is, is a new member of the CSE team. Albert's responsibilities include devo developing and executing the organization's strategic and tactical objectives in the region. Prior to working at ICANN, Albert served as an ITIS auditor and also held the position of regional IT manager at KPMG Eastern Caribbean and account supervisor IT trainer, group IT director at ISIS World Corporation. Albert has served on numerous boards and has brought internet technology related experience. He has attended several ICANN meetings, having been involved in the fellowship program as both as fellow and mentor. Albert holds his Bachelor's of Business Administration in Information Technology from Monroe College. He also completed, plum, completed additional coursework in project management from the University of Cambridge and holds multiple certifications and training credentials. So I would like to invite Albert to come and share with us your view on internet governance. Thank you very much, Shunan. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure.
Okay, when Shannon said that I've been recently appointed as manager for stakeholder engagement for the Caribbean, he wasn't joking. Uh, I started on the 1st of June, actually, 2013, and uh, when I heard uh, Martin this morning speak about the IPv6 and all of the speeches that he had made, over 100 and I think 30-something, how many was it? 134. And I'm thinking to myself that today I have to make my second official speaking engagement on behalf of ICANN, that it may be a bit of a challenge. But in any case, uh, as Shannon mentioned, I have been involved with internet for some time. And uh, hopefully, you know, I can make my contribution to this whole debate on internet governance. The title of the presentation is basically how ICANN fits into the uh, internet ecosystem. And uh, you will hear that word a lot with regard to the internet and ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? Uh, it's a situation where you have interactions among organisms and between organisms and the environment. So with that definition, I think it's safe to say that the internet itself is an ecosystem and it's thriving because it's an ecosystem that is open, transparent, and collaborative. Now, when we look at the components of the internet as an ecosystem, we see that there are organizations, individuals, and processes that shape the coordination and management of the global internet. And uh, all of these entities are interdependent. And uh, ICANN is one of the organizations that uh, contributes to the internet ecosystem. ICANN's responsibilities are very specific and they relate to the naming and addressing functions. Sometimes there tends to be a bit of confusion with regard to what the roles of the various players uh, in internet governance are, but with regard to ICANN, there is a complete focus on naming and addressing. So essentially, ICANN takes care of what we refer to as the domain name system, uh, names and numbers, and uh, the d domain name system, for those of you who may not fully be familiar, converts names and numbers into, converts names into numbers. So when we need to communicate with somebody on the internet, ICANN's functions ensure that the message gets to the correct person. So the DNS keeps the internet safe, secure, reliable, and scalable, and uh, ICANN was formed essentially in 1998 to manage the DNS. So I hope uh, as we go through the discussion and we talk about the roles of the various players that we'll see the contribution that uh, ICANN makes to internet governance. Within ICANN, there is what we refer to as a multi-stakeholder model. And what this means in very simple terms is that all of the stakeholders have an opportunity to contribute to policy development. We're talking about end users, regulators, service providers, government, academia, and everyone who has an interest in the workings of the internet. And this multi-stakeholder model works by a bottoms-up process, and that is the main mechanism where every individual and organization can contribute to policy related to names and numbers. This list that you see on the screen right now is a more detailed list of the specific functions that uh, ICANN coordinates, the DNS, the IP address allocation, the protocol parameter registry, root servers, the GTLDs, the CCTLDs, and time zone management. Again, this is a very clear and specific list of the areas that ICANN has responsibility for. Now, within ICANN, there are several sub-organizations that uh, allow ICANN to fulfill its mandate, and uh, the main one that we hear a lot about is IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. Because when it comes to the issuance of IP addresses to RIRs and to individuals, these IP addresses are managed originally by IANA. To support the functions, there are three supporting organizations within ICANN, the addresses support organization, the country code names supporting organization, and every country within the Caribbean and uh, also globally has its own 
CCTLD, and you must be familiar with that. Um, and also we have the generic domain names such as the .coms, the .edus, and so on. So there are these supporting organizations which uh, give guidance and support to the overall ICANN functions. Also, ICANN operates with a board of directors, which is the ultimate policy-making body. And uh, the board of directors is very diverse, very international, with members of varying skills and from uh, geographically dispersed locations. So there is, from time to time, the thinking that ICANN is a United States-based organization, but uh, in reality, ICANN is a global organization where the persons who sit and serve on working groups, on the board, on councils, and so on, come from various countries all over the world. There are four advisory committees which expand the multi-stakeholder input into ICANN processes. Uh, we first have the ALAC, the at-large community, which essentially represents the users of the internet. And ALAC has several uh, institution organizations across the globe. One of the primary organizations that supports users is the ISOC, and you'll hear, hear a little bit more about ISOC later on. But essentially, the users of internet have a very big voice with regard to policy development within ICANN. Of course, government is a key player, and there is an entity known as the Governmental Advisory Council within ICANN, which provides uh, advice to ICANN, which comes directly from the governments of the world. And there is an opportunity here for every sovereign country and for every territory to have the voice of its government heard in the ICANN policy development. And of course, we have the technical advisory committees, DNS root server, security, and stability. In addition to those entities, ICANN also takes advice from two advisory bodies, the Technical Liaison Group and the Internet Engineering Task Force. Both of these uh, have seats on the ICANN board, so policies can be infused into the ICANN policymaking process directly from these two entities. So in terms of the process of allocation of names and numbers, the IP addresses are distributed in a hierarchical system. And as I said earlier, IANA allocates the IP addresses to the various RIRs. And I know, of course, we are being hosted by LACNIC, which is one of the IRRs which serves the Caribbean region. And ARIN also serves some of the territories in the Caribbean region. With regard to policy, uh, this is again developed through an open consultation process. And global policy is developed and sent up from the IRR, RIRs to the address uh, supporting organization with ICANN, and as I said earlier, ultimately going to the board. The within ICANN, uh, there are certain uh, characteristics which, which form the general approach to how policy is developed. And these are listed on this slide. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder model, and policy is driven by community consensus in a bottoms-up process. So typically, there are working groups of volunteers which come from various stakeholders throughout uh, the, the community, and they come up with draft policies. These policies are then put out for open comment, and any individual or organization has the opportunity to comment on the draft policies, after which there is an update, and then eventually the policy is put forward to the board of directors of ICANN, and then a uh, final decision is made. ICANN focuses heavily on security, stability, and interoperabil interoperability. There are many new devices which are being developed from time to time, and one of the important aspects of the internet is that they must all work. They must all be able to communicate with each other. And uh, there are contracts between ICANN and registrars and registries in terms of selling domain names to the ultimate users. And ICANN has a legal department which takes care of compliance and ensures that the operators uh, keep in line with what their contracts say. So again, we have the multi-stakeholder model. We have community-driven policy, 
uh, ICANN, especially with the new generic TLD program, which we can talk about later on, those of you interested, promotes uh, competition and choice, security and stability we've spoken about, contractual compliance, and uh, there are some new I initiatives uh, with regard to top-level domains, CCTLDs, IDNs, and IPv6. Uh, you can look quickly at that list. We've been hearing quite a bit about what's happening with the new generic top-level domains. Again, I can, with its policies, is hoping to promote competition and choice. Uh, with the CCTLDs, the country code, top-level domains, ICANN is attempting to ensure that there is expansion of local content and expansion in the overall operation of the CCTLDs. And uh, many of the new comers to the internet don't speak English. And uh, there is a move to allow those users to access the internet in their own scripts. Most of us use the Latin script where we use the letters of the alphabet A to Z but there are many users who don't use those letters. So an internationalized domain name is a system which allows a user in Arabic or some other language to access uh, the internet. And again, ICANN is very busy in this particular area. And then of course we heard this morning about IPv6 and ICANN is working with the other players to ensure the adoption of IPv6. So essentially, ICANN operates in terms of policy and governance with a bottoms up structure, which includes many different stakeholders. One of the big stakeholders is the at large community, the users. And uh, what we hope to do is to increase public policy statements based on input of the various stakeholders. The most important slide perhaps is this one where we take a look at how you as individuals or organizations can contribute to internet governance through policy development. There is a website, myican.org, where you can keep up to date with everything that's happening with regard to policy development within ICANN. And you can configure it in such a way to get regular feeds on the areas that you are interested in. If you're interested in CCTLD, or in the GTLDs, or in security or stability, you can configure my ICANN to set up and send you alerts based on the topics that you're interested in. Most, all of ICANN's work is fully transparent through the ICANN website, and uh, you can visit that website and make your own public comments on draft policies and on updated drafts of policy, and also on final policies. If you want to participate at a much higher level, you can join one of the working groups that actually develops some of these policies. You can volunteer as a member uh, within the CCNSO, within the GNSO, or on a working group which is actually developing policy. So finally, essentially the internet is governed by several entities, several organizations which are diverse, which tend to have a multi-stakeholder approach to policy development. And uh, the ICANN is one of the organizations which uh, contributes to internet development. And uh, the whole and key issue is how can you participate in what is happening with the internet development. Now, I'm just gonna show you a short video which summarizes most of what. What does ICANN do? To reach another person on the internet, you type an address into your device, a name or a number. That address must be unique so computers know where to find each other. ICANN maintains and administers these unique identifiers across the world. Without ICANN's management of this system, the domain name system or DNS as it's known, we wouldn't have a global scalable internet where we can find each other. Within ICANN's multi-stakeholder model, civil society and internet users, the private sector, national and international organizations, governments, research, academic and technical communities are all represented. ICANN's community-driven policy. To keep pace with dynamic technologies and rapid innovation, ICANN enables consensus-driven, 
multi-stakeholder policy development with broad representation from the global internet community. Competition and choice, from accrediting over 1,000 registrars to introducing new top-level domains, ICANN works to expand consumer choice by fostering competition and innovation in the domain name marketplace. Which functions does ICANN coordinate? The domain name system, internet protocol address allocation, the protocol parameter registry, root server systems, generic top-level domain name system management, country code top-level domain name DNS, and time zone database management. Security and stability, ICANN supports DNS security through technical training and engagement, coordinating and collaborating with the community in the implementation of standards such as DNSSEC. Interoperability. ICANN's work enables new technologies to flourish while maintaining interoperability across the global Internet. For example, management of the unique protocol identifiers allows communication using secure connections between users. Contractual compliance. ICANN oversees the contracts it maintains and enforces consensus policies developed through the community-driven process. ICANN's contractual compliance function seeks to ensure compliance with the agreements and the consensus policies. Who's involved? A number of groups, each of which represents a different interest on the Internet. All of them come together with the board of directors. The supporting organizations on addressing, country code names, and generic names. The advisory committees, at large, governmental, the root server system, security and stability. And the technical advisory bodies, the technical liaison group, and the Internet Engineering Task Force. How do I participate? Sign up for updates at myican.org. Join one of the many public comment forums on ICANN's website. Attend ICANN's public meetings in person or online to provide input at a public forum. Or join one of ICANN's supporting organizations or advisory committees. already familiar with some of this but you know during the course of the discussions if necessary we can go into further detail we can also talk a little bit later on about the Latin American and Caribbean strategy where we are looking to get a higher level of Caribbean participation in the various projects thank you very much thank you Albert at the end, there will be possibility for us to ask questions. So by n for now, I just would like to give the presenters the opportunity to present, and at the end, there will be possibility to ask questions. The next presenter is Andrew Gorton. He is the Group Head of Regulatory Affairs at Digicel, responsible for regulatory strategy at Digicel Group, which operates in 23 countries in the Caribbean and the Americas. So, Mr. Gordon, please come forward and share with us your thoughts. Thank you. I haven't got a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to speak to you from my from here. Um, from the operator's pers perspective, uh, well I guess we look at things slightly differently. We, we are a profit-driven organization. Um, I don't feel there's that much involvement from the operator uh, community in, in a lot of internet work currently. Uh, and that's partly because um, we are not sure to what extent it has, it has an impact on our business. Now, it's clear that IPv6 is vital for the internet. Without it, we can't continue to operate. But that seems to be well in hand, and LACNIC and uh, ARIN and other registries are dealing with that. Um, but uh, from the perspective of the, the operators, the, the cost of things like internet transit, uh, which are 
uh, for, at the forefront of our minds. Um, now, in order to get more operator involvement in, in this community, and you know, I would like that personally, um, it would be incumbent on people like myself um, to try and communicate to the operators uh, how this has a bottom line impact on our businesses. And that means that what ca it can do for profitability and how it can reduce our costs. Um, and I need to communicate to them the, uh, the achievements of these organizations. Um, on is that too quiet? Okay, right. Yeah, sure. Okay, that's, that's louder, yeah. Um, on the other side of things, I'm glad that LACNIC has got outreach programs um, because without those, it will be difficult to justify going to a lot of these meetings, as I say, because it's um, the, the commercial operations often have difficulty seeing how this is going to be a benefit to them. Um, uh, so uh, that's one, one part of the... Uh, one thing, in, t in terms of op improving operator involvement, uh, those are some of the things that can be done and, and are being done. Um, in terms of just generally across the Caribbean getting more involvement, uh, again, it's, it feels like there are so many organizations and I've seen the overall internet governance structure. There's about, uh, I've seen about 20 organizations in an organization chart. And it's uh, just a huge mass of uh, organizations and it's difficult to see how you can have an impact or where the important points lie. And everybody's stretched for resources, and I know individual Caribbean governments may only have one person who might be, might be able to spend an hour uh, every two weeks or something like that on these kind of matters. Um, so it's difficult to get uh, their involvement. Um, so, um, that is why partly I think uh, Caribbean governments have been relying on organizations like the ITU, which are not popular with certain uh, jurisdictions in terms of getting involved in the internet, um, because people are familiar with the ITU. Uh, they know the people there. Um, it deals with telecommunications, and I think the Uni United States, for example, look at it slightly differently. They want to keep the internet out of it, but the, um, the ITU looks at telecoms, which includes internet services. Um, uh, whereas the FCC 1996 Act, for example, defines telecoms rather differently, uh, and the outlook is rather different. Um, but the United States and these larger countries have far more resources to put into dealing with all these organizations. If you're a small organization, and I even digital, although we operate in 30 countries, we have limited resources in terms of doing this stuff. Um, even we would have great difficulty in attending more than a tiny fraction of, of the meetings or spending much time on this, uh, unless we can see a clear benefit. Um, so that's, that's overall my kind of first point. Um, uh, the second point I want to deal with is, uh, in particular, internet uh, security. Um, in terms of avoiding government interference with uh, the multi-stakeholder model, um, it appears to me that that's very high on the agenda. Every uh, regulator I go to brings up the issue of, of, uh, of security. Every ministry is, is high on the agenda. They're very concerned. They're concerned about public embarrassment. Um, so it's important for the community, the internet governance community, to have that high on the agenda and to be seen to be doing something. Otherwise, I can envisage that um, there will be kind of, there could be more potential formal intervention uh, by governments, um, people might, s might start sliding into IT regulations, that kind of thing. Um, um, thirdly, and my, and my final point, this stretch goes into internet uh, it's governance policy and in terms of how we get the internet to more, more people um, and get it used by more people. Um, I, d I was talking about this um, yesterday, in fact, um, but particular, in particular, in terms of increasing speed and latency, and I will split the two down, of internet services. And I separate speed from latency because video is absolutely dependent on a constant, fast video stream. And users will not look at it if it starts breaking up. So you need a, a very constant stream um, from your, your transit service. Um, and that also applies in terms of looking at individual web pages. 
individual web pages have got to load within a few seconds. I believe the empirical data shows that people have to get the pages open within about three seconds, four seconds max. If you go past that, you lose them. People won't look at it. Um, and in order to achieve all this, I think there's there is considerable scope in the Caribbean, certainly. I don't know about Latin America. Within existing resources, to dramatically uh, improve things uh, with what we've got already, um, and this would be in particular um, enabling access to all the facilities, which pro such as ducting from telecom providers, um, any trenching work to do with uh, water works, gas works, ele um <coughs> electrical infrastructure for delivering power. Um, across the community, um, building regulations which ensure that ducting is always installed when there's any trenching work down roads. When, when houses are being built, there must be uh, a, requ a requirement to provide access for telecoms uh, infrastructure to, to go into the house. Now, I think all these things within existing resources can make a big difference, and certainly in the Caribbean, because it, it just doesn't happen currently at all. Um, and it would tremendously reduce the cost of rolling out um, infrastructure, speeding up uh, broadband, and uh, help to reduce latency and improve use of telecom services. So those are the three points I'd like to make. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Andrew. Our next presenter is Mr. Selby Wilson, and he's a telecommunication strategist at the CTU, Caribbean Telecommunication Union. Selby Wilson is a professional chartered accountant. He holds a master's degree in telecommunication regulations and policy. He has over 30 years experience in both the public and private sectors. He was the general manager of the Trinidad and Tobago Telephone Company from 1972 to 1981. He is also a former Minister of Finance in the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago from 1986 to 1991. He serves on the board of directors of several companies. Mr. Selby Wilson, please come forward and share with us your thoughts. Thank you very much, Sherman. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you through the activities of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union in their promotion of what we call advancing the Caribbean internet governance activities. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the CTU. Then we look at how we went about advancing the IG agenda. I will identify the priority areas that we chose to work on, given the large expanse of activities in the field of internet. And then I will tell you the next steps that we will, we will be engaged in in pursuing this agenda. The CTU is an inter-regional government organization that was formed in April 1989 in the Bahamas. It came into force on the 17th of July 1990 when they obtained the required signatures from the participating governments. On the 17th of September 2004, 
the Council of Ministers amended the mission and the objectives of the CPU, mainly because of the convergence of the technologies, we thought we should focus more on ICT issues. And in doing that, they also decided to expand the membership beyond the governments in the, in the CARICOM region to include the private sector, regulators, academia, and civil society organizations. We believe in the multi-stakeholder model, and we work very well in that mode. Our guiding principles are influenced by our values, which are integrity, transparency, accountability, and excellence. And we have beliefs that we have to be innovative, we have to collaborate with others, and we must build partnerships across the globe. And all that is being done to achieve our outcomes which drive us. We are hoping to see and achieve a seamless Caribbean. We are working towards an enabling environment, educated citizenry, affordable access, and beneficial use of the technology. You would have heard Shannon said, say that governance is difficult to define depending on where you come from in the globe. Well, we had difficulty when this mandate was given to us in 2005 by the CARICOM Secretariat to address governance, internet governance issues we had difficulty in trying to determine what those issues are. And therefore, we, in doing our research, we adopted this definition from the Working Group on Internet Governance, which says, Internet governance is the development and application by the government, the private sector, and civil society in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. This definition resonates quite well with our own belief that we must work with all stakeholders. What are CTU goals? The goals we identified in taking up this assignment were one, to focus, identify and focus on Caribbean priority areas. To work towards a harmonized policy environment in the region. To develop appropriate projects. To build capacity, we think it is vitally important to build human capacity in this space. And to address cybersecurity and cybercrime issues. The progress we've made since 2005. In 2005, the CARICOM Secretariat appointed the CTU to address internet governance issues, and that was in January 2005. Capacity building. We have staged, and my Secretary General boasts of the fact that as far as we can determine the Caribbean Telecommunications Union was the first organization globally to begin staging an internet governance forum. So as we speak, we are about to stage our ninth internet governance forum, and it is more than the global internet governance forums. We, have, we feel very strongly that our ministers and policy advisors have to be informed of the technologies, the trends, and the direction if they are to formulate proper policies. And therefore, we have run several ministerial internet governance seminars. We have attended several workshops on internet 
technical, internet governance, technical, and policy issues. And we have conducted, in fact, we were crusaders across the Caribbean for the establishment of IXPs. And we have conducted 12 IXP workshops. Policy frameworks, we have, in fact, in 2009, published our first Caribbean Internet Policy Framework document. That document is currently under revision because of the changing nature of the environment. We do have a marked up copy on the website and I would invite you to have a look at it and we would appreciate your comments and contribution to the second version of this policy framework document. We have also established and developed an IPv6 guidebook for the benefit of the stakeholders in that space and for the governments in the region. And of course, we have participated in several global internet governance policy proceedings. In keeping with our desire to work collaboratively with others and other stakeholders, we have built collaborative relationships with ISOC, ARIN, LATNIC, Pakis Kleinhaus, ICANN, NIC.PR, Gauch Research Foundation in Puerto Rico, and we always include all the other stakeholders. Institutional capacity building. Based on our several ICT roadshows, we spawned off KaibNog which is now held about five meetings across the Caribbean. The purpose of CAIVNOG is to bring the technical people together to solve regional challenges and problems. And that has worked very well. People are very excited about the establishment of CAIVNOG and they are making a meaningful contribution in the region. Policy frameworks, I've covered that. Now when we looked, when we were scoping what our resources would allow us to do, we identified five priority areas. The priority areas being physical infrastructure, logical infrastructure, internet content, and research, and, and public awareness. Our efforts in the physical infrastructure space, we embarked on a program to convince regional operators that there is an opportunity for the Caribbean, which is um, to establish across the Caribbean in each of the countries, IXPs. So far, IXPs have been established in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Curacao, St. Martin, Grenada, BVI, St. Kitts, and Suriname. And in progress, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent. Logical infrastructure, we have addressed the issues of supporting regional collaboration and effort to enhance critical internet infrastructure, example, DNSX and root service. Internet content, in December 2011, the Council of Ministers of the CTU adopted a declaration of St. Philip's in Barbados on cybercrime and cybersecurity, which is now driving our work in that area. We've had two ministerial sessions in concert with TICTE and Ramja and one ministerial workshop in December 2012 on the question of internet governance. The Comnet Foundation and the Commonwealth Secretariat have also worked with us in the area of developing um, issues in the internet governance space. 
and of course the CTU had the responsibility to steer the HIPCAR project, which developed a number of pieces of legislative text, which many of the countries are now adopting into their legislation framework for the sector. Our public awareness, we believe that the public must not be left out of this information sharing. That they must be made aware of the power of ICTs and the power of, of the internet. And they must also be made aware of the dangers of the internet. And therefore, we in our different forum, fora, always speak about, uh, those fora are the Caribbean Internet Governance Forum, the Caribbean ICT Roadshow, which has been run in 19 countries since June 2009. We have staged many workshops and seminars and ministerial briefings throughout the Caribbean. And we have had publications on policy and guidelines on ICT things. We support some of this work by engaging in research and we have used GOUT Research Foundation in Puerto Rico. The IDRC Foundation has funded the research in five topic areas, which we have completed and which we have shared with the ministers and the policy advisors throughout the Caribbean so that they can formulate better policies on an evidence-based um, evidence policy. We've also worked very carefully with Package Clearinghouse, and Package Clearinghouse has in fact been one of the agents who supplied the IXP switch to some of the countries who have participated in that development. Where are we now? We have root servers deployed in Haiti, St. Martin, Curacao, St. Kitts, and Nevis, and root servers planned for Grenada, Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, and BVI. What are our next steps? We are intent on building on the successes we have achieved so far. So therefore, we will continue focusing on those priority areas identified by the CTU. In 2012 and beyond, we will be looking at broadband, e-government, the further development of IXBs, cybersecurity and cybercrime issues, and we will promote active participation in regional and global internet governance fora. We are, as I said before, in the process of reviewing and updating version one of the internet governance policy framework document, and we'd appreciate your comments on that. We intend to work with Caribbean governments and stakeholders to implement the IG policy recommendations at both the national and regional levels. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the work that is being undertaken by the CTU at this time in the promotion of internet governance in the region. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. Our next presenter is um, Mr. Raul Echeverria. Raul Echeverria, a Uruguayan national, is the CEO of LACNIC, the Internet Addresses Registry for Latin America and the Caribbean since 2002. Since May 2006, he is a member of the Internet Governance Forum's Multi-Stakeholders Advisory Group. IGF MAC, appointed by the UN Secretary General. Raul Echeverria is also member of the Internet Society's Board of Trustees since 2008, and he served as a chairman of ISOC Board of 
Isaac Board between 2009 and 2012. He is, a recognized, he is recognized for his contribution to the development of the internet in the region. And his leadership has been instrumental in making LACNIC a key player, both at regional as well as at international level. Raul Echeverria. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you very much, everybody. I promise that this is the last time that I speak in this uh, meeting. Uh, in fact, uh, I try to concentrate all my, my, my interventions because uh, I have to leave tomorrow. Uh, so you will be released of my, my presence. <laughs> um, I, I will speak about uh, what I think is, is happening on discussions about internet governance at the regional and global level and what, in my view, are the, will be the priorities in the agenda in the next uh, few months. Um, we have made uh, a lot of progresses in, uh, in with regard to the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, since uh, 2003, when uh, the, the, the discussion on internet governance started, I think that the world in that, in that area has uh, changed very much. In fact, um, it was surprising for uh, some of us when in the, during the preparatory meetings of the uh, first uh, part of the uh, World Information Society Summit in Geneva, 2003, the preparatory meetings, uh, this uh, topic of internet governance uh, came up. And I think that uh, most of us uh, were not paying too much attention to the process of, of the World Inform uh, Information Society Summit because uh, we thought at the time that the summit was uh, mainly about uh, um, access and how to um, deploy internet uh, around the world and how to take advantage of the benefits of the information society. And some countries uh, brought this, um, this uh, topic to the table. Um, they were the countries that uh, were more interested in increasing the participation of governments in, the, in internet governance. So it was, uh, uh, we at, at the beginning we felt a bit uncomfortable with uh, this discussion we were not prepared for that, so we have to uh, to prepare on the uh, on the fly. But as, uh, the discussion was very positive because uh, while the discussion was started by the governments that try to have more uh, influence in internet governance, the result was that the definition of the internet governance that was uh, agreed in 2005 was uh, much broader than, than just uh, talking about uh, domain names and IP addresses. And so, uh, due to the fact that the, the, uh, a set of principles uh, about multi-stakeholderism, uh, participation, openness were uh, approved uh, with regard to internet governance, it gives us the opportunity to claim for multi-stakeholder discussions on many topics like security, uh, intellectual property rights, um, access, and many things. So I think that's uh, really, we started with um, a discussion that has been uh, beneficial not only for, for the internet community, but also for other areas of human activities because now the multi-stakeholder model is also being applied for in, in, in other areas. It's something that I think that there is a before and after the discussion on internet governance. Um, so, uh, we in the internet community well, that have changed very, very much. Uh, we had almost no relationship with governments and civil society before 2003. And now, as you have seen in my previous presentations, we do many things with intergovernmental organizations. We participate very actively. And so I think that we, we have progressed, the advanced the multi-stakeholder model in a very interesting way. But it's not enough. 
when um, I, I don't agree with this vision of, of the war that uh, the war is divided in, in two groups of countries, groups that are in favor of um, the freedom on the internet of people and a group that is against the freedom. Um, recently, you know, when we had, the, there was a very important meeting in, in Dubai in last year, uh, Wikid, the, where the Telecommunications International uh, Treaty were, was discussed, and the result was uh, that the, the the countries were split in two groups: uh, those that were were against the, the signature of the new treaty, and the, uh, those that were in favor of that. But if we look at the uh, more carefully at the, what are the the, the attitude of uh, all the governments. We see that the reality is much more complex than that. It's a, this is a great simplification of the, of the, of the reality. There are some uh, uh, some governments that have a long tradition in uh, in intervening in uh, all the activities uh, uh, in their countries. Um, that they have also a long tradition in controlling and uh, many things. Um, uh, also, in many cases. Uh, to not respect the human rights. But this is because there the, are uh, some strong reasons, like cultural reasons, or religious reasons, uh, or political reasons. And uh, it is, uh, there are very few things that we can do in that with regard with, those, uh, with the uh, behavior or positions of those countries. That uh, the, 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 the positions that they have with regard to internet governance are very consistent with the positions that they have with the rest of the things. Um, so the only thing that we, we can do is to support uh, as citizens of the world, we can support the fights uh, in favor of uh, respect of human rights. And this is, there are no more things, not much more things that we can do in the, uh, specifically in the field of internet governance. But w there are other group of, of governments that are also in the position of uh, um, asking for uh, more participation of governments in the in the control of the internet um, that there are, that are countries that don't have this tradition in the in, in other areas so here there is a problem is the problem is that uh, for some reason the those uh, countries don't see uh, don't feel uh, uh, that the, the expectations are satisfied uh, with the current uh, internet governance mechanism. And so I, see, I think that this is the, the big challenge that we have in the, in, the, in the short term, in the near future, is to those of us that are convinced that the multi-holder model is really the, uh, the best model for managing the internet governance, uh, have to open our minds try to understand the expectations of, of those stakeholders and try to uh, in introduce the necessary changes if needed in order to fit their expectations. So I think that there is a, biggest, a big room for, for uh, political action, trying to uh, agree because not all the governments or other stakeholders that are claiming for changes in internet governance uh, are those that are against the, the freedom in the, on the internet. And so this is one of the, uh, of the challenges in the, in the future for the, the internet governance is what we, uh, we uh, know as the, the expression of enhanced cooperation. There are other topics that are becoming more and more important in the discussion. One is privacy. And other one is the jurisdiction, uh, you know, it's uh, especially related with the cyber security. Uh, there is a uh, cyber crime, there is a, a discussion on how to deal with the problems that uh, are originated in one country but uh, have effects in, in, in other, for example. So um, those issues of privacy and uh, jurisdiction have uh, gained much more popularity in the last few weeks. And I think that's uh, everything that is related with the internet surveillance uh, will uh, will uh, be 
going up in the ranking of the of the preferred topics uh, in the uh, global discussions on on internet governance. I think that there's uh, many things to discuss, and uh, I think that the the most important thing is is uh, how to make the human rights uh, respected. Um, how we are sure that the 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 when the some people is investigated for some uh, uh, reasonable reason, it is uh, done under the due process, and all the the, the people have the the uh, the warranties that the rights are respected, and so also there there will be discussions on. Uh, how can uh, one country inspect packets uh, in a that belong to a communication that is uh, uh, is between uh, two people or two uh, machines that are in in other two countries? So there are many things that will be discussed and uh, related with privacy and jurisdiction. Uh, so of course, one of the most popular topics uh, remain being uh, security. Uh, and stability, and and one, I think that's another topic that will be uh, also going up in the ranking is cloud computing. I think that's uh, I say that uh, some of the most important topics uh, for discussion are privacy, jurisdiction, and security. And cloud computing is uh, the perfect um, topic where we will find implications of the in the three in those three aspects. Uh, implications with regard to privacy of the users and uh, jurisdiction because uh, it many times it is not clear where the, the, the data uh, under what uh, which the jurisdiction the data is stored or the applications are used and, and security about the information the security of the information that is uh, stored um, as you can see human rights is becoming a one of uh, also the, the a transversal uh, um, theme that uh, everything related with the respect of human rights on the internet is um, is uh, becoming more and more important and uh, there are more discussions so it's, um, those are, are some of the uh, uh, of the topics that I think that uh, will be uh, part of the will be uh, Becoming more important in the in the discussions on in, in, the, in the agenda of internet governance, uh, both at the global and regional level, and I think that there is a challenge that we, we have made a lot of progress in, as I said, in the implementation of multi-stakeholder model and at the global level, and also at the regional level. I mentioned before that, the, for example, the case that LACNIC participate together with governments in the. Um, in uh, intergovernmental mechanism, and we participate almost in equal footing, and we are always welcome, and so we make contributions that we think that are valuable. But so I think that's uh, even the fact that we have uh, made progresses at the global and regional level, I think that's uh, the, the challenge is now to implement multi-stakeholder models at the, at the local level. And I think that this is the, the it's a difficult step. It seems to be a small step, but uh, it's, uh, I think that uh, it will not be easy. But those uh, communities that uh, delay more the implementation of um, uh, multi-stakeholder mechanisms for discussing global issue, uh, local issues are those that uh, will have more troubles in the, in the, in the future. Because uh, I think that's uh, one thing that we have discovered or realized uh, uh, with this, uh, with all the discussions about internet governance, is that the, the wisdom and experience is not a monopoly of anybody, and is uh, highly distributed. And, and we need the participation of all stakeholders in order to create the most valuable synergies in a, uh, for the benefit of the population. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. Are there questions? I would like first to ask the audience if there are questions, and if there are not, I would like to ask the panelists some questions. But let me first give you the opportunity to ask them some questions. 
Okay. We know that we do have in our region, as um, was mentioned, some challenges going on. I would like to start first with um, ICANN and with um, Albert Daniels. We know that um, in all, ar all around the world, we do have a lot of registrars, but we don't have, I'm not sure, um, up till a few minutes ago, I'm not sure, but um, we don't have registrars in, especially in the Caribbean. Um, what, what is being done, for example, by ICANN to promote this? Um, what is the reason that we cannot have our own, let's say, go daddies, you know? So what, what, what is being done by ICANN to promote this in order for us to get our own registrars? Okay. Thanks for that question, Shannon. Uh, running a, a registrar operation is essentially running a business. And uh, that is driven by the normal drivers for running any business. W uh, the, the key one, which is uh, demand. Now, there is a difference between a registrar for GTLD, the dot coms, mm -hmm. and so on, and registrars for the CCTLDs. There are quite a few registrars for CCTLDs because the CCTLDs tend to go into their own legal arrangements with companies that are interested in selling their domain names. Some of them do it on an individual basis. For example, uh, .lc may decide to go into relationships with two or three companies uh, who are willing to sell the CCTLD for that country. Uh, sometimes the GoDaddy's go into relationships with several CCTLDs. So if you go, for example, to GoDaddy's site, you would notice that they sell the domain names for several countries. And this is true for several registrars. So again, uh, if the operators of registrars in the region feel that there is some good business prospect, then I'm sure you know market forces would drive more business to start in that area. But I guess it has to do with outreach and capacity building and understanding of the opportunity. And uh, the point at which we are able to engage Caribbean business persons to the extent that they see a value proposition for running as a registrar operation, I think then we will see a higher level of registrars. But the reality is there are existing registrars uh, within the region for some of the CCTLDs, not many obviously for the GTLDs, and there are also several registrars which are known, well known as international registrars which sell domain names, CCTLDs, for the country code domain names. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Andrew Gorton, I've noticed that one of your challenge, one of the challenges that you have been mentioning is um, internet transit cost. So you have been highlighting this in this session and elsewhere as well. So um, I'm looking now at, although you did raise the question, I'm looking now to um, at um, Selby Wilson of CTU, what do you think could be done to reduce all these internet transit costs in order for our friend um, Andrew Garton to be happy? Well, in the first instance, I think that the operators, the ISP operators in the Caribbean need to realize and appreciate, first of all, that we can keep local traffic local. And therefore, they should move more quickly to establish national IXPs. If that can be achieved, then the next driver to bring the cost down will be more competition on the international routes. Um, we are currently faced with a situation which is of concern, and, and that is the, the, the joint venture arrangements between uh, cable and wireless and flow, which virtually establishes uh, one party being in control of all the fiber in the region, and by extension, to those fibers connecting internationally. Uh, I think we have to be 
concern about it, as good as the intentions might be, it, 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 it is, in my view, not a healthy development. Okay, thank you very much, um, Salvi. Then I would like to ask um, Raul, or not, first let me just go back to Salvi. You have been mentioning cyber security issues going on in the, in the Caribbean as well. We know that the Caribbean is not immune, although people might think that nothing is happening in the Caribbean, but there is a lot going on in the Caribbean with respect to cyber, cyber crime. And I know that um, CTU has been discussing this, so on short term, what, what are the plans in this regard? What does um, CTU think that they will be um, focusing on in order for us to address these challenges? The focus has to be on building more awareness of the issues surrounding security, the secure use of the internet. I think we made a quantum leap when the ministers, after um, being informed through a seminar about the dangers of cyber crime and, and the need to, for cyber security, they immediately adopted a declaration of St. Philip in Barbados in December 2011. Since that time, we have partnered with SICTE to run additional seminars on this issue. It, it has become a feature of our roadshow to inform and advise on the matters surrounding security and the secure use. Um, we are also very concerned about the secure use of the internet by children, because more and more young people and children, in fact, using the internet. And we, are, we have concerns about what they do on the internet and how their parents can be guided um, to protect them from this global highway of information. Perhaps, Shannon, if I could also comment on that. Yes, uh, Raul had also alluded to a Latin America and Caribbean strategy with regard to uh, activities on the internet. And there were some major activities in the region where a process was started to try to identify priority areas. Interestingly enough, uh, there were initially 60, six zero priority areas identified and that was shortlisted down to about 40 priority areas, and then it was brought down to 10, and we put a criteria in place to see if we could get the top five priority areas so that we can embark upon projects to do some activity with regard to the Latin America and Caribbean strategy. And of those top five, there are two that are directly related to security, and one of them is capacity building with regard to security, stability, and resilience workshops, and what is actually going to be happening in the region now in a project approach is that teams will be put in place both with uh, volunteers from Latin America and the Caribbean region to come up with a strategy for putting together these uh, SSR workshops. And secondly, uh, another one of the five top priority areas for projects was the development of emergency response teams for CCTLDs. So we're essentially looking at providing some kind of security support to the country code top level domains in the event of some sort of incident in the region. So uh, you're absolutely right that security and stability is high on the agenda, and this has been illustrated by the fact that two out of the five priority areas in the Latin American Caribbean strategy actually relate to security. Okay. Thank you, um, Ali, for your comments. Selby? Uh, I also think that there has to be uh, a greater willingness to share um, these cyber breaches. Mm -hmm. I think we're still in the phase where companies are not sharing the information for fear of damaging their reputation. Mm -hmm. but, but that is the biggest damage they can have to their reputation if they don't share the information and encourage others. To, because this, this, is, this is not just a Trinidad issue. It, is, mm -hmm. it, is, it needs a lot of collaboration, a lot of um, thought and working together mm -hmm. to solve it. Maybe we can ask Raul, how do you think uh, a commercial bank should, I mean, share that particular information that 
it was attacked to the community, given that Selby is asking this. What do you think, how do you think such a commercial bank could, could do that? This is the most difficult question is for me. <laughs> Okay, I pass. I, I got the, the next one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know if uh, what uh, do you mean exactly with the, your questions, uh, but um, if it is regard with, with regard to the security, mm -hmm. um, I think that's that we are um, working with uh, with a lot of uh, CSERTs that some of them belongs to the private sector and some of them belongs to the financial sector. As we are uh, working with them, creating uh, um, platforms for collaboration. Uh, we have organized uh, uh, four, three or four already, uh, Carlos, three or four meetings with c uh, um, And so we sit on the sa around the same table, uh, people that work is, uh, for not-for-profit organizations or intergovernmental organizations and private companies, bank uh, among them. Uh, they exchange experiences and information about best, best practices and how to deal with uh, uh, with uh, security uh, challenges. I think that it works very well. When you create the uh, um, um, an environment that is um, the um, this is a good environment for trust in each other, uh, for creating confidence, and uh, I think that's that it is the the. the the collaboration is, uh, is very fluent. Okay, I have a question for Raul. You have been a defender of the multi-stakeholder model. In this particular model, all stakeholders give their contribution to the development of the internet. And we know that we do have governments as well being, part, being one of, those, of these um, stakeholders. But how do you deal with this issue by having governments being part of, a, of the multi-stakeholder model and they are the ones, let's say, elected in a given country, so they think that they are the ones that should take, let's say, the final decision in, in, in any given um, environment, let me put it like that. So how, how do you promote this model and, and, and what is the relationship with governments taking into consideration that they are elected in, the, in their particular countries. Okay, uh, may I have 30 minutes for? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, there are two questions. Um, so one, of, uh, one of things is that I think that's in, the, in, in this particular region in Latin America and the Caribbean, in, a, in all the region, uh, we have achieved a, a level of maturity in the relationship among stakeholders that is, uh, is not very common in other parts of the world. Um, I think that it's, a, it's an example. And we have to, care, uh, to take care about that and, and to try to Im improve every day the relationship among all stakeholders. Um, so uh, it works uh, very well. Um, I, I feel very comfortable it's not a problem for us uh, to, to have the governments uh, very uh, near of LACNIC looking at uh, what uh, we do. It's uh, all the opposite. And so we, are, we feel very comfortable communicating with governments and trying to receive feedbacks and trying to anticipate uh, any concern. Uh, it's a, a frank relation and direct exchange is, uh, is, is key in the, in, in for that. Uh, going to the second thing is uh, is really uh, this is one of the things that are, I think is more interesting in the uh, in this moment in the uh, evolution of uh, the information society. I think that's uh, 80 years ago uh, when people used to vote for a representative, the the delegated 100 percent of the uh, of the responsibility because uh, the city says. Uh, didn't have at that time any information um, about um, uh, any uh, issue that uh, was discussed. So people uh, trusted in the, peop in the, in the others that uh, they voted for that they would be in, uh, in the capacity of dealing with uh, everything. But so at, at probably eight, 80 years ago, if a, if a president or a, um, um, was elected with a, 
55% of the votes, it, it would uh, have been very fair to say that uh, he or she had the, the power of the representation of that people. But the, the world has changed very much. And due to the, the, the availability of the technology and the access to information, uh, so, uh, the, the people has uh, the possibility of taking decisions and having their own opinions about uh, many things. So they continue electing, uh, uh, based on the same uh, elements, uh, continue electing somebody for representing them, but not in 100% of the things. And so it's a, we had, when I was a member of the, of the working group on internet governance, that was a group that was created by the UN Secretary General in 2004, uh, I, I say at some moment that the discussion, really the discussion that was behind any other discussion in, in internet governance was if the governments are the only, uh, the, the only um, uh, legitimate representative of the interests of the people. And my answer is no. My opinion is no. And some governments that, that were in the same room say yes. Uh, so this, but this is, uh, I think that's the, uh, the, one of the challenges in the information society is, is will be all the, the, the changes that will be the introduced in the, gover in the government systems. Because uh, we don't know what will be the, s the expectations of the citizens in 20 years. And so I think that the structures of government uh, have to be very flexible in order to, to fit those expectations that we cannot anticipate at this moment. Because as Martin Levy said uh, this morning, the next uh, 18 years will be the, the changes that will be very different of the changes that we saw in the last 18 years. So I think that's, uh, the, the that's very difficult. I think that uh, the people that is, I think that young people that is, uh, uh, coming in the uh, politics, I think that we have to trust that they will have a different view about the society and so they will be more uh, flexible and more um, um, uh, s friendly with, uh, with this kind of uh, multi-stakeholder and open model. Sorry for the long answer, okay. but the no. question was very uh, no, it's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Raul. Um, Albert? Yes, perhaps I can give an ICANN perspective on the role of government in our multi-stakeholder model. Uh, ICANN receives input from governments through the Governmental Advisory Committee, known as the GAC. And the GAC's role is to provide advice to ICANN on issues of public policy, especially when there may be an interaction between ICANN's activities or policies and national laws or international agreements. Now, the GAC is respected as one of the stakeholders, just like all of the other stakeholders. So it's not an automatic situation where advice to ICANN from the GAC is uh, accepted. And there have been several cases where uh, there have been disagreements between uh, the, the board of ICANN and the advice that it has received from the Governmental Advisory Committee. But the relationship is a very respectful one and in cases where there is a difference of viewpoint between the ICANN's board and the GAC, uh, the board is obligated to provide a formal response outlining very specifically what the reasons were for having a dissenting view on various issues. So uh, we feel at ICANN that the multi-stakeholder model is an open and transparent one where every entity has its voice but it does not necessarily mean that you, you agree with every perspective that is put forward by, by every stakeholder. Okay, thank you, Albert. I would like to ask um, Andrew Gorton, given that you have been discussing and have, has one of, the, of your challenges, internet trends is cost. Um, given the current model that we are utilizing with respect to telecommunications and internet, do you still think you could maneuver, if you can use that word, between to get your business done? Or w w would you like to see a completely different model being developed? Well, I haven't got a clear answer on that. I, I was thinking about that before. Um, the situation tends to be the tier one providers all connect with each other and then uh, you have to pay transit to the tier one providers and they don't want to interconnect with anyone else. Um, 
and I, I know there's been some noises about having some kind of intervention and requiring them to uh, effectively interconnect with uh, other with I ISPs. Um, I, d I don't have a clear view on that. I was wondering about it this afternoon, actually, but I'm not sure. It, would invo it involves getting in. The prices have been falling very dramatically. I mean, I've, s I've seen uh, a table of prices um, over the last 10 years. So arguably, it's, it's working effectively already in terms of, as long as you can get the uh, internet price out of, uh, out of uh, centers like New York or Miami. From, from the perspective of the operator, the other, the other aspect, in order for us to get access to those prices, uh, what we do need from cable providers is uh, our indefe indefeasible rights of use. And um, those give you, as you know, uh, say a, a 15 year right to use uh, a particular amount of capacity on a cable. Um, and it's, it's because of that that we'd be able to, we've been able to offer the kind of plans that we do in the marketplace now. Um, uh, just to give you an example, in, in Jamaica, we, uh, I won't quote specific figures, so I'll quote you the transit figure. The tra transit figures is about, are about $2 to a megabit per second per month. We can get from uh, New York or Miami, and uh, I think we'll be talking something like, uh, uh, more like $150 plus per megabit per second without that. So it's, uh, you know, getting on. 70 times more expensive. And the, the only reason we could get IRU is because there's competition in cable provision. And before there was competition, we couldn't get it. So that, that was a major concern for us. Um, I've uh, round about, uh, I've, I've given you a, a whole part of the question, didn't I?